Hello. Hello, Marianne. <laughs> Welcome, Paul. Thank you. So, you've written a memoir. Well, I have. It's been going for quite a while. How long has it taken you? Well, I started like 10 years ago, I guess, and I could never get it right. I kept sending bits and pieces to my editor, uh, Julie, and she was always encouraging, but I could tell it sort of wasn't quite hitting the mark. And um, then about 18 months ago, I suddenly got an idea of how I might do it and I would have another try. And, uh, and what was that brainwave, that how you might do it? Was there... Well, it, traditionally biographies start with, you know, my grandfather who lived here and my grandmother there and then my father and mother and so on and sort of worked the way through in a strict chronology. And I suddenly thought, well, basically I'm a storyteller. You've got to tell the truth, but I could tell it like a story as if I'm writing a novel and I could use the same techniques I would use in a novel. But so, you've been a short story writer, so... Well, that's true. I, my specialty has been short stories and, uh, I, you know, a short story has to end with a sort of a, a bit of a surprise or something to take away. So I thought, well... Okay, that's what I'll try and do in in this. So, does it have a happy ending? Well, you have to wait the whole distance. The novel's more difficult, and also I'll sow little hints the way you do little uh, things of something to come that might be interesting. And will that issue be resolved? And uh, so I thought that sounded. Different. I always like to try for something a bit different, if you can do something a bit different to the way other people do. And so is this um, memoir or autobiography, is it like a series of short stories with an overarching theme? Well, yes, it does, it, it, it does have a type of an arc in it. Um, most biographies do. The usual thing with a biography with an arc is... Uh, Especially with someone like someone who's succeeded, like a rock star or a film star or a famous general, you know, you start with the child, they've got an objective, they try, 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 they fail, and then at last they succeed, they get up there, everyone knows them, they're famous, and then usually through bad luck or drugs, or silliness, or, or something like that. They crash this failure, and then they have a comeback, and it finishes. And uh, I didn't do it exactly like that, because it didn't exactly fit my story. But there were certainly things I was trying to achieve. And I guess the theme of it, or a theme in it, is loneliness. Because even people who are very successful can be lonely in the middle of all that fame. And uh, I want my reader to know, did that person become happy in the end of it? And did they find an answer to that particular problem? So I, I guess it, it does have an arc. And uh, another thing I tried to do with the book was I thought, home in on things that that uh, I might have some skill or knowledge of and make sure they go into it. So one obvious thing is, you know, I've written over 50 children's books and more than 100 short stories. I thought, OK, I'll, I'll let the reader into a bit of that world. You know, what's it like to try and get published? What's it like to get knocked back? What's it like inside of a publishing house? What do they really think about their authors? You know, what's the relationship between an author and his editor? How much power do you have? All those sort of things. So I've put that in there as well because there are a lot of people wanting to get published and that might be useful to them. And are there how to write tips? That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> well, there are how to write tips in it. I, I've sort of said, well, you know, here's some things that are 
particularly if you're writing for children, here's some things you can do and you can't do, and uh, or you know things that I think work. And as part of that, what I tried to do was use the process of writing the biography as an example of how I do it and what I'm doing. And so I started with a confession, which was, look, I don't know how to write a biography. I've never done it before. And on the way through, I'm going to tell you some of the real problems I'm having. And, uh, you know, there, there, there are things you come across, like, for example, you're talking about real people, not fictional, and they're possibly going to read it and have some response to how you're portraying them. But you can't portray everyone as angels because we've all done silly, stupid things and some people have done some really nasty things. And then are you going to dump on them or aren't you? is that not the right thing to do? So I'll discuss issues like that as I'm going through. And um, I also put a little, few little comments that my editors made to me and said, oh, Paul, don't do this, you know. That's, <laughs> that's not a good idea. I'm heavily involved with my editor. Yes, I did say to my publisher, Erica, I haven't felt as excited about a book uh, since my first one. <laughs> that, that excited. I'm always a bit excited, but I was really excited about this, but also really nervous because yeah. there's the way people who are in it might react as a big thing. So are you feeling really anxious now that it's coming out soon? I'm feeling both excited and anxious. Um, one of the things that uh, my advisors were saying to me was, let yourself be vulnerable, Paul. Don't, don't try and project uh, this sort of cocky self-confidence, but open up to your vulnerabilities, your fears, your worries. And uh, I did that and I also well, I tried to do that and I, I did let out some secrets that I've never told anyone except my very closest confidence before um, on some issues because basically I'm thinking what's the point of this book? What's the use of it? Apart from the fact that you know, I might sell and make a little bit of money and uh, I enjoy the writing process. But hopefully people will read it and hopefully find something about their own life that might be helpful to them. And particularly if you're going to talk about your fears, failures, hopes, mental health, um, and I, I believe very strongly, I've, like my bookshelf's full of biographies. I've, mm. I've got a, oh, scores of biographies. And um, I find them useful, very useful mm. in, in understanding myself and my own life. So I am hoping that when people read this book, they will get a few things that will be useful to them as human beings who are struggling <laughs> through this very difficult life we have. I would have thought it would be rather difficult for you to come across as cocky. That's, I don't think that's the image that you project or, or who you are. But uh, I think that was good advice, really good advice. Well, it's nice of you to say that, but actually one of the things that people have to deal with if they do become successful in what they do is you can get cocky and you can feel privileged and you can feel above the crowd and that is the way to unhappiness. And uh, I struggle with that, just like nearly everybody else does. Mm. So what actually, what was the um, impetus behind that first, I'm going to write a kid's book? Well, I did love reading when I was a child. I, and I particularly love short stories. My mother loves short stories, funny stories, short stories. Uh -huh. And, and, um, <laughs> and uh, some early books of mine were the William books by Richmond Crompton, who I should say at the age of 11, I was incredibly disappointed to find out was a woman <laughs> because she wrote these stories about this uh, scruffy, 
uh, naughty boy, and uh, I, I used to relate to him, William, very strongly. And I thought, how does he know what it's like to be an eleven-year-old boy? You know, and um, but. But I have I, to say, you've had um, eleven-year-old boys and girls write to you, and there was one letter that you really cherished, where the child said. Yes, I, I did get a very lovely but short letter from a, a boy who said, Dear Paul Jennings, how come you know what it's like to be me? And, uh, well, I thought, I have achieved something there. I don't know what it's like to be, to be him, but I do know what it's like to have your first day at school and uh, nobody liking you, uh, to feel embarrassed to be this small person in a world of giants. And uh, that's basically what you've got to be able to do to write for children, I think. Yes. And uh, so that was indeed a lovely compliment. And so when you were deciding to write that first story, you, uh, were, uh, you had children, you'd had a job, but your marriage had broken up and this is where you start the memoir or the biography, autobiography. Yes, and yes. Well, it wasn't the first time that I thought I could write. That happened when I was 13 and I wrote up a little funny incident that happened when I saw a snake when I was out camping one day and uh, I sent it to Woman's Weekly, uh, which my mother had. That was the only sort of publishing venue I could find in Australia that, and uh, when I was aged about 13 and um, I got a very nice rejection sent to Master Paul Jennings um, saying that they didn't want to publish it and uh, I was devastated by that. I thought, well, I'm no good, you know, people who write books are famous geniuses and I'm definitely not one of them. My school report certainly showed that. <laughs> and um, so... I didn't really have another try until I was 39. And so you did um, a writing course and handed in a story and your uh, writing teacher, I think Carmel Bird, whispered a couple of words to you. Yes, well that's right. Well, I, I, I was the father of uh, four children at the time, single parent and... Um, I was lecturing training teachers and my subject was reading education and uh, special education with kids with disabilities. And I'd done a little bit of academic writing, not much, but a little bit. And I had to, I, I couldn't go ahead with my master's degree I was studying uh, because it involved research. And you needed to be with the kids. And I had to be with the kids. so. I uh, said to my boss, look, I can't do this master's degree. And he said, well, Paul, Deakin University is taking over this place. That was the Warrnambool Institute of Advanced Education. And he said, you won't be able to keep your job here if you don't have a master's and do a PhD. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I just can't do it at, at the moment, you know, with four kids, a single parent. So he said, is there anything else you'd like to do? And I said, well, I'd like to write a children's book and publish into the mainstream. And uh, he, he, he said, are there any courses? And I, I said, yes, there is one. There's Council of Adult Education course in Melbourne. I knew that that wasn't really the sort of thing he had in mind, but... He said, look, keep it under your hat, <laughs> but I'll give you one of our cars, a works car at the Institute, and you can go down once a week to it for the first term. And uh, so I did. And when I went, I was incredibly nervous. Like, uh, I, I definitely wanted to succeed in writing fiction. And there was quite a mixed bunch of us there, all waiting in the room, a few university students, some people unemployed, some pensioners, 
one businessman, I think, and uh, quite a mixed bunch. And we all sat sort of nervously waiting and in came Carmel Bird, well-known novelist and uh, literary critic. And uh, she was sort of dressed in a long black robe and a hood like some a person in a fairy tale. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it was really interesting. And she said, now you've got to go away and write a short story and bring it in and I'll read them. Uh, so I, I did. I wrote one called Unhappily Ever After and handed it in. And then the following week she came in and I was really nervous. I mean, I... It's, it's different sending out fiction. It might sound silly, but you're sort of exposing yourself. It's like sending out your love. And if you don't get it returned, it's, it's uh, painful. Anyway, she plonked all the stories on the desk and she said, look, they're all good um, and I've enjoyed reading them. Uh, but one of them's got some special features I'd like to talk to you about. And I'm going like, please let it be mine, please let it be mine, you know. <laughs> it sounds pathetic, I mean, but this man that age. But anyway, it was, and she read it out really nicely. And as we were leaving, she just leaned over and um, she said, whispered in my ear, and she said, you're good. <laughs> and uh, I sort of rose up... <laughs> and floated out of the room. And, <laughs> and started and your down, fairy tale writing career. <laughs> down Column Street, just for the <laughs> fact that she said my story was good. And, um, mm. But she'd written in the... Uh, she'd written in the uh, side of some comments and they were all nice little things. And there was one she put, you can't say that. And I thought, I read the paragraph, I thought, what's wrong with it? I read it and I read it, I thought... You know, have I done split infinitives, have I changed tense, have I <laughs> even spelled wordy correctly or something? I, I could not find anything wrong with it. But I wasn't game to go and ask her because I was supposed to be teaching, <laughs> you know, the, the, the teaching trainee teachers how to teach reading and I was, should have had some linguistic skills. So I never asked her and... Um, Many years later, many years later, when I was a little more worldly wise, I was still pretty naive in those days, um, I was on a panel in, at the Brisbane Writers Festival. So I thought, I'm going to dig that story out and ask her what was wrong with it. So I opened up, <laughs> opened up and I read the paragraph and straight away I'd I saw what was wrong. I had written the sentence, the car jerked off. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <laughs> That's great. So, well, it will give a lot of people a lot of hope that, you know, you can start at 40, go and do a writing class somewhere, and who knows, maybe. Yes, I think so. I mean, I often think back and I think, why did I give up so easily, you know? <laughs> Um, I did get a little bit of encouragement at school, a little bit, but uh, I, you never know, do you? No, you never know. You never know. And you had the added impetus, I think, of your son finding it difficult to read. Yes, that's true. I did have a, another reason, which was, and a major reason, was that one of, one of the problems teachers have and parents when they've got a child who's a reluctant reader and doesn't like reading and it maybe has fallen behind a bit or a lot mm. is to find a book they can read that they want to read they, and and uh, while I was looking for books for him at the time they had these things called um, remedial readers which were, were sort of written with a few words but older themes but I basically thought they were pretty boring and and what did he think of them well he was reading one one night and he suddenly heaved it across the room I can remember I was sitting in front of the fireplace and um, his words were a little unusual for what well, he would have been about 
11 or 10 or 11 at the time, and he said, um, he yelled out, I'm sick of these piddly little books. And uh, <laughs> I picked it up and I thought, I think I could write a better story than that. Uh -huh. mm. And that's how I came to start. Yes. And I did come to the conclusion, it's not really any such thing as a book for a reluctant reader. Basically, it's got to be good enough to hook in the good readers too. And uh, that, that was the point I started at, I thought. Great. Yes, that's, that's the approach I'm going to take. And, um, and it so happened, it, it took off in Australia, well, it took off in, in um, the UK and everywhere, because up until then, um, there hadn't really been anyone publishing short, funny stories for kids for a very long time, had there? No, that, uh, because when I did get my start, I wrote three short stories and I sent them to six different publishers and uh, they came back the first uh, f the first five came back with negative you know w one of them said we quite like these stories uh, but we took it to committee level the publisher and they thought it was a bit too off the wall uh, and uh, the, and some of them said short stories are not in and they're not the genre we're interested in. But part of the reason was I like short stories myself. And part, part of the reason was that if you're talking about reluctant readers, if you've got eight, eight stories in a book, at the end of the first story they get a reward. If you've got a little surprise ending or funny story, they can stop there and they've had a reward. Whereas they don't have to wait till the end of the whole yeah. thing to see what happened. So... You became master of the twist at the end, didn't you? Well, it's nice of you to say that, but th that's what I aim for. I say, can I get a twist in the ed end of the tale, particularly a funny one? Yeah. And uh, every time I think, I'll never do it again, you know, because <laughs> it's so hard to come up with an original twist and an original thing. And, uh, uh, but that's what I aim for. What you aim for. And of course you are, you know, hugely well known really around the world because of Round the Twist. Round the Twist was really popular and... Uh, well, so those kids became icons of a generation. You know, there, there are heaps of people out there who just love one of them based on your daughter. <laughs> yes, well, I gave my kids a choice of... They wanted me to use their names in it, and, um, and some wanted to, some and some wanted didn't. to, and some didn't. And uh, um, I, I did base parts of their characters on yeah. on the characters that I was creating there. And uh, so, do you live in a lighthouse? <laughs> uh, I didn't live in the lighthouse. Um, I actually started the series based on my own life with the four kids at home. Uh, we only had three in the TV series, but uh, I, I, um, we lived in an old house that I moved on the edge of a cliff in Warrnambool, came there on a truck, and I thought it would be a great opening scene to have them sitting around the table, the family eating a meal when the signpost goes past, you know, and then another... Uh, <laughs> Lamp post goes past, and you, you suddenly realise that the house has been moved. The house has been moved. <laughs> that would have been good. And uh, when I sent it in, the producer said to me, "No, you can't have that." They said because that's just the first episode, and moving a house for one episode, you blow the budget. You will blow the budget. They said <laughs> you've got to set it in the one place, and we'll build a set and so on. So I actually set it in the Twelve Apostles down on the Great Ocean Road, which is not too far from here in Warrnambool. Yep. And uh, then they said, there's no lighthouse there, you know, and I said, well, can't you build one? <laughs> and they said, no. Um, so the nearest one was Aries Inlet. Right. And I thought the lighthouse would be a very romantic mm. uh, spot. So they used the Aries Inlet one and they did build an interior set for the lighthouse. In so, Melbourne. Um, I wanted to 
ask you because you actually appeared as an extra in Round the Twist. And I just wanted a, 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 an exclusive really here because I was wondering if you could repeat for us the acting that you did. Explain to us the little scene that you were in and then if you could just do the acting that you did that day. Is that how you're going to finish up, is it? <laughs> well, yes, they let me be an extra uh, in a few of the episodes and I was pretty hopeless. And um, But they said in this particular one, you can be the ghost in the story, Paul. And um, in the end, the ghost that's interacted with these children is going to say goodbye and we'll film it on the beach just as the sun's setting. And, you know, you can be there and smiling and wave to the children as the sun just disappears over your shoulder. So um, anyway, I got uh, this, I got a stage fright, as it were. <laughs> you know, so I was saying, smile, Paul, smile. I said, I am smiling. You know, it was pretty hopeless. So I did, in the, in, in the end, sort of get a little a uh, bit of a smile up and managed to wave and sort of, because the sun, they were saying, hurry, the sun's going down. But I did manage it in, in the end and I went, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so you used Stanislavski's acting method, I can see. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, it's, you've had a really varied career. Like, uh, really, it, Round the Twist is huge and it remains huge in... in in Australian culture, you know. But on top of that, you had the, the Unreal books, you had the um, all your own books. There were a heap of them, weren't there? Um, and then you had the, uh, uh, what was the other series? Oh, you had the Cabbage Patch Dolls? Yeah, I had no, the Cabbage Patch Fib. That was a series. I had um, the Gizmo series. The Gizmo series. I mean, and every was... kid in Australia had those books in their bookshelves and every parent read them to their kids. So you're across the generations and um, I think you paved the way for kids' literature in Australia. Mm. Well, that's very kind of you to say. And look, I'm not just saying that because... We go to bed together every night. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you, Paul Jennings. <laughs>